good evening everybody sorry for the delay uh, welcome to today's episode of uh, marvelous medicine which is going to be an introduction to underwater medicine uh, i have great pleasure in welcoming back dr surinder pal singh who was with us for the high altitude medicine session he is the head of department of physiology at the army college of medical sciences delhi dr singh did his mbbs and md in physiology from the armed forces medical college pune He served in the Indian Army Medical Corps for 26 years, during which he worked in academics and senior administrative positions. Dr. Singh was a teaching and research faculty at the Indian Navy's premier institute of naval medicine, Mumbai. Uh, he launched the program in high altitude medicine at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Rishikesh, and headed the high altitude research center for the Indian Army at Leh. Dr. Singh has 22 publications to his credit. he was a consultant to the ministry of health and family welfare on recommendations for oxygen therapy in patients at high altitude and his a- other areas of interest include respiratory physiology and hypoxia sports and exercise physiology diving and underwater medicine uh, welcome dr singh all i had to do um, was just uh, request that there should be a session on underwater medicine and dr surinder pal singh put the entire faculty together and i uh, thank all of you for readily accepting our invitation and uh, making this session possible over to you dr singh thank you so much ma'am good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen it's a pleasure to be here again with all of you uh, we were here last as ma'am said talking on high altitude medicine and now we are talking of exactly the opposite underwater medicine So for me, it happened the other way around. I worked at the Institute of Naval Medicine, uh, where we were, as Chaitanya said, working under pressure, and uh, then went on to high altitude medicine. So while at the INM, I remember a couple of incidents. I once did a days of sailing in a submarine, and uh, I wondered how these guys do it for months all together. Uh, the environment is uh, not the most uh, convenient, so to say, and uh, can be rather stressful and then i was working uh, doing a research project with divers and they offered to take me diving you know, so i told them i'm not a very good swimmer uh, the divers uh, curt reply was saab jab doobna hai to tairne ki kya zarurat hai so <laughs> now that is the attitude that these people have fantastic people uh, hats off to the, all of them and uh, the three speakers we have today my job is only to introduce them and uh, i shall do that because they are all stalwarts in the field of underwater medicine surgeon captain gokul krishnan surgeon captain uh, commander rohit varma and surgeon commander chaitanya kotange retired all three are stalwarts of underwater medicine all three graduated from the armed forces medical college and uh, then did their post graduation in underwater medicine from the institute of naval medicine bombay uh, subsequently Chaitanya went on uh, to also do an MD in psychiatry and is also now a wound care specialist. So these gentlemen are accomplished people. I shall briefly introduce the first speaker and then introduce the others to you as we go along. Uh, so the guys shall be set rolling today by Gokul, as we call him, Gokul Krishna. Gokul, uh, who is the principal medical officer and is uh, uh, at the School of Naval Medicine in Mumbai today. He's an academic par excellence. I've known him since he was in college. He was two years our junior. Now, Chaitanya and me are batchmates. He was two years our junior. He has always been an excellent academic, uh, one of those uh, rather intelligent creatures who live in the straight, uh, you know, rare strata of uh, the environment. Uh, strange that he should choose to dive. Uh, he has uh, some other feathers in his cap. He's been to the military med- medical academy at Saint Petersburg in Russia, where he's trained in nuclear medicine and radiation safety. He's also been to the Premier Defence College, Defence Services Staff College at Wellington, where uh, army officers, non-doctors, train for administrative services. Uh, Gokul has served in all classes of submarines of the Indian uh, Indian Navy, uh, the diesel subs, the larger subs. Uh, I guess Gokul will tell you best about those. He has commanded a hospital. He's an intrepid researcher. Has multiple papers to his name, and has written chapters in books. And as a eclectic mix of hobbies, let me warn you: these three gentlemen who are speaking to you today are multifaceted people. So uh, I'll tell you more about the others. But Bokul, uh, I do know that I, what, what I found most interesting was Bokul wrote uh, a strict comic. He's actually authored one. 
Wow, that's fantastic. And it was written better than the original, I guess. Uh, he is very interested in military history. He knows Russian language. He's a classical music enthusiast. And he's an alpine skier. And this is just the beginning of his CV. So I shall not stand between you and him any longer. Over to Gokul. Gokul, take it from here. Thank you so very much for those very, very kind words, sir. Can I request Surgeon uh, Commander Kodange to please share the slides that I made? Uh, pardon me, gentlemen, I, uh, I am uh, working through a proxy and flashing my slides. There was some issue with uh, the hardware that I have uh, with me right now. So uh, I'm here to cover the first of the, the, the prime variant, first of the trilogy series that we'll be having today with uh, two other speakers to follow me. And I'm here to just introduce you to what diving medicine is all about. Can I have the next slide, please? Just a second. Yeah, this presentation from me is dedicated to the two mothers, my, my, my alma matches, the Armed Forces Medical College and the Military Medical Academy in Petersburg. Uh, can I request you for the next slide, sir? But the colors of the depth have always been fascinating. Mankind is always taken to the depth with its myriad fishes and the various sighting and uh, a few have cited mermaids. But what we tend to forget when we look at something really eye-catching is the kind of uh, danger that lurks behind every shell and behind every rock. Uh, this is evident as you see the next slide. This is a, a world champion we are talking about. Natalia Molchanova had um, numerous records. She was a 23-time world champion. And uh, let me just go closer to what I have written there. She was just having a normal day at, um, uh, uh, you know, day diving, uh, diving off the coast of Spain. And it was a very, very modest depth. She never surfaced. The sea just took her. We don't know what happened to her. Now, when this can happen to the greatest athlete that ever died, uh, there is a, 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 lot of, uh, a lot of care and caution that is required to understand why diving is important and why diving medicine is important. I'd like to cover the presentation under the following head. We briefly touch upon the history. We'd like to know why we dive. Read about diving physics and gas loss. Uh, a little glimpse about the diving physiology. The effects of changes in pressure on the human body. And then he pass the baton on to the other speakers. Uh, man has been taken to warfare underwater for now approximately 3,400 years. The first of the underwater campaigns is recorded in 1210 BC when the Hittites uh, used depth charges against the Cypriots. Uh, famous names have always lent uh, glamour to any trade. Uh, diving is no less. Uh, names ranging from Alexander the Great to the Roman historian Pliny to Da Vinci and Borelli have all been intrigued and have also designed methods to overcome the troubles of holding breath and going underwater. The underwater environment, as we see, is a very special place full of mystery and excitement. And man has been fascinated. He wants to go back to where his roots are. And the initial knowledge that we gained by observation of marine animals has been further refined with uh, the kind of information that we have with physics. And we have tried to conquer this contact. We have learned to dive deeper and longer by adaptations, acclimatization, technological advances, and the study of underwater physiology. And today we shall talk about underwater physiology more. We talk about how the human physiology adapts to living underwater. We talk about the diving man, mammal physiology as a comparative study. We talk about diving physics and gas laws as are applicable to divers. So we briefly touch upon various diving equipment and the techniques. And we'd, I, along with the uh, next two speakers, will talk about the medical problems that are associated with increased pressure. Next slide, please. Uh, science has always, always supported diving in helping overcome a whole lot of uh, troubles that mankind faced while initially trying to go down deeper. And in this, the contribution of doctors is immense. Paul Bert, who's a French physician, actually helped overcome the deep challenges by propounding, propounding the inner gap theory. And he described decompression sickness. So here is a doctor who helped divers go down deeper. And the second one is uh, another famous name, John Scott Haldane. Uh, 
in our profession, we tend to sometimes only remember doctors who have contributed to medical marvel. But here is a man who helped set standards for saturation safety. And this still remains the basis for the standard diving tables, which are used today in diving. In diving world. Research with goats have always translated to uh, tangible benefits for human beings. And uh, this is probably the reason why divers are to, today more akin to goats that are called as goats. And what you see here is Dr. Haldane, who's peeping out of a chamber which was constructed by him. Haldane, by uh, a stroke of luck, also managed to do a whole lot of self experimentation and managed to survive to write about it. Uh, this is one of the few doctors who didn't succumb to his own uh, intricacies and experiments. Indian doctors have not lagged far behind. So we have had a stalwart by the name of Dr. Ridikula, who's described uh, an entirely new gas lesion syndrome in man, which is called as isobaric gas counter diffusion. Indian divers and Indian diving medicine specialists have over years overcome the depth challenges, and now we are more than comfortable in carrying out saturation diving over 250 meters. And the Indian Navy is the only Navy to use two, two entirely varied kind of uh, submarine escape systems. One is a, the NATO pattern or, uh, or what is called as a non-deco escape set, and the other is a Russian pattern escape set with stoppages where the diver ascends by gradually increasing it. Uh, Uh, I'd like to break the monotony by giving you some trivia. Uh, doctors have been responsible for many non-medical inventions, ejection seats, submarine escape training towers, and hot water bottles were invented by doctors. And the recipe for the cocktail pink gin gimlet is also uh, attributed to a naval surgeon, a surgeon re rear admiral gimlet of the Royal Navy. Why do we need to die? Now, if you do not need to die, we don't have to deal with the trouble of the underwater world. We need to dive because diving is, an, is a very enriching sport or a recreation or an adventure activity. Other than that, people use diving to earn a livelihood. For many, underwater construction and demolition is the source of income. There are approximately 3,000 commercial divers who dive in US every day, just in US alone. Uh, ship salvage, submarine rescue is uh, another important military uh, guided uh, diving operation. The continental shelf exploration for resources is now fast catching up. We run short of resources on land, we have to look underwater. So with all this, it's very clear that we need to dive. And why do we need to understand diving medicine? It's because as we just saw, diving is risky, but the term risky doesn't cover the myriad risks that a diver faces. First is the aquatic medium itself, where one can simply drown, can have saltwater aspiration syndrome, or because of immersion suffer from hypothermia. We make custom-made gas mixtures. We never breathe the air that uh, Lord God gave us. So we, we tweak it, we add, we subtract certain gases, and we use different equipment. Each of them produce their own problems. So you would have an inert gas-induced narcosis, an excess of oxygen producing seizures in the form of toxicity, and so on and so forth. In the pressure gradient, as you shift from a lower to a higher pressure at a rate of speed faster than the human body can adapt to, you would have decompression illnesses and barrel comas coming. Then the work that you do underwater, not all diving is fun. As we just discussed, we need to work underwater. So you would get injured, you get arc burns. You might get entrapped when you're doing some underwater clearances. You may simply run out of gas or the reabsorption that you use for taking care of your carbon dioxide excreted by you is by using a chemical called soda lime that can scald you. On top of it, Underwater, it's not just you who's diving. There are a whole lot of animals underwater which can either bite you or can cause envenomation. So with all of this comes the speciality of diving medicine. Now let's quickly go through the stages of development of diving. Initially, we were just holding our breath and going as deep as we can. You're on your own. Then came in the years uh, 1700, diving belts, where you are put in a container, allowed to go down. You just peep out of the container, do some little trivial job, and you get back. And then we improved a little bit. We started developing metallic hard hat, which is connected by tubes to surface gas supply. So you are tied with an umbilical to surface air. The air is pumped into your helmet and you continue to do some creative work underwater. This became too heavy. So we started developing a self-contained human backpack air supply, which is called scuba. This came about in 1940s. And then we moved on to living underwater. 
in saturation diving and underwater habitats. In the 1960s, there was a proliferation of them where you just simply go out for a walk and carry out that. So you come back and stay in a pressurized room and you go out to do your diving. And finally, to date, you have a suit which pressurizes you to a single atmosphere pressure. So irrespective of which depth that you operate in, you are wearing a suit which keeps you as if you're on, 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 uh, on firm ground. Talking about breath hole diving, which is the oldest form of diving, usually you sustain up to about 40 meters depth. It's still practiced world over by various pearl hunters and divers. But we know that with diving reflex and with uh, uh, the safety precautions kicking in, you can breath hold to an ex to excess of 20 meters if you're well trained. And the world record breath hold depth, which is achieved is 213 meters. We come to the second trivia of the day. There is a community of Paravars of the Coromandel Coast who have been pearl diving for many centuries now. The brother-in-law of the diver holds onto the safety rope and is responsible to his own sister for bringing her husband home safe. And in those, in those old days when there were no watches, the man used to sing a Tamil song of a rough, roughly three minutes duration so that he would know what is the end of the endurance of his brother-in-law and he quickly you know, pulls him up after that. Diving belt, we just uh, you know, spoke about some of these advances where man can be made to sit inside this and then lower down. And then came the hard hat diving. The hard hat is supplied by what is called as a surface supply. The surface supply is connected to the machines which pump gas to you into your helmet. This is used prim predominantly in commercial diving activities. And then came the self-contained scuba with the man who invented it. This is the wax museum. This is from Jacques Cousteau. With scuba came portability. You are on your own backpack, but you use a whole lot of other devices, regulators, an alternate air source, the pressure gauges, the, the dive computer, which tells you at what depth you need to stop to get decompressed, the weighing belts, the fins, the air tank, the buoyancy compensators, the mask, and so on and so forth. And this is the aqua lung, which is with the inventor who designed it himself. This is von Jacques Lund. And then lastly, we spoke about the underwater habitats. This is an example of one of those. So from the diver of yore who was in a plated armor suit to to date, where we are wearing a one eight at a suit, there has been tremendous advancement which has taken man to greater depth than ever before. All this is possible because we studied our physics and we remembered those, those famous gas laws which were so boring in school. Let's see them one by one, very quickly. We need to understand the term pressure. Pressure is the atmospheric pressure exerted by the Earth's atmosphere, which is pressing down on us, the air column that is above our head at the sea level. Over and above that, as you go deeper into water, there is going to be a pressure of the water column called as the hydrostatic pressure, which will act upon the diver too. So the diver is subjected to an absolute pressure which is the atmosphere, which is hovering over the Earth's surface and subsurface under the water level, which is the atmosphere pressure, which is exerted by the hydrostatic water column. One atmosphere's absolute is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury or 14.7 pounds per square inch or approximately 10.4 meters of fresh water or as a thumb rule, 10 meters of seawater. Every 10 meters of seawater, you add one atmosphere of pressure there because that is, the, that is the equivalent of the hydrostatic pressure of the water column. So air at surface, one atmosphere pressure. At 10 meters seawater, 10 meters is adding on one more atmosphere to it, so it becomes two atmosphere. At 50 meters, it is five plus one at surface, it becomes six atmosphere. Actually. There are four important gas laws. Actually, there are more, but today's topic, we just quickly brush through these four laws. Boyle, Charles, and so on and so forth. Boyle's and Marriott's law states that if the temperature is kept constant, the volume of the mass of gas is inversely proportional to its absolute pressure. So as the pressure increases, as you go down from surface to 30 meters, 
the volume decreases. So the balloon that you carry will shrink in size as you keep going down because it is not vented. Charles Law stated a similar equation, but with temperature as a constant. The diving set pressure gauges show different pressures in depth due to cold water. That is because the volume of any specific quantity of gas is directly proportional to temperature. The temperature reduces, the volume reduces. Uh, the man who defined this law is Jacques Charles. He was a balloonist. He never actually published his law. His law was actually published by Gay-Lussac, who actually credited this law to Charles. So when we combine the boys and the Charles law, you get what is called as the combined gas law in which P1, V1 by T1 is equal to P2, V2 by T2. This is what we studied in class one. Dalton came up with a postulation that the total pressure of a mixture of gases equals the sum of the pressures of the component gases. Air is a mixture of gas. For simplicity's sake, we take that air contains nitrogen and oxygen at a rate of 21% and 79%. So the partial pressure of each of these gases is going to add up to form the p-total. At 10 meters depth, where the total pressure is two atta, the partial pressure of oxygen is 21% of two, that is 0.42, and the partial pressure of nitrogen is 79% of two, which becomes 1.5. Dalton also discovered color blindness. Interesting people. Uh, Dalton's law is extremely relevant in diving. The gases which are used in divers are mixtures. They are made to order. They are prepared as per the physiological tolerance levels. Uh, extending this law, we'd have the basis, physiological basis of toxicities of oxygen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and in a gas process. We quickly go on to the next law, which is Henry's law. At a given temperature, the mass of a gas dissolving in a liquid when in contact with or across a semi-permeable membrane is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas. That means the higher the partial pressure, the more the gas dissolving in liquid will happen. Now, this is extremely important to understand how inert gases dissolve in blood and in plasma. On surface, the, the, the solubility constant of nitrogen means that about one liter of nitrogen dissolves in blood. The moment you go to 30 meters, it will be four liters of nitrogen because it is at four atoms. The solubility and diffusion of gases is also owing to many other constants other than Henry's. There is a Van Kolk equation, which is the partial pressure of diffusing gases under liquid tension. There is also the molecular weight theory, which is called as a gas constant. And there is also a time and a temperature variable. But all this is confusing. What we need to simply understand is, could you click please, sir? The different variables work differently while ascending and while descending. Hence, you may end up diving quickly you may reach your depth quickly, but you need to ascend slowly. Otherwise, you will bubble up. The bubbles will start to fall. Quickly talking about certain physiological constants, I'll take just about uh, five more minutes to wind up, please. Sir. The next slide. Human response to diving environment is governed by physiological, acclimatization, adaptation, and pathological changes. The adaptations, system-wise, we just quickly touch upon. The one peculiar adaptation in the CVS is the diving reflex. Diving reflex is driven by bradycardia, peripheral vasoconstriction, and apnea. Diving reflex is initiated simply by phase immersion. Even the whole body need not be immersed. And it is trigeminal afferent driven. And diving reflex is one of the methodologies of treating PSVT. In respiratory system adaptation, there is thoracic squeeze. That means extending the Boyle's law. When we hold our breath and go down, the volume of the gas in the lungs are compressed. They may compress to less than residual volume. The average depth for an average sized human being to go up to residual volume is about 37 meters. The implication is that one liter of residual volume is considered sufficient to maintain the gas exchange between breath, but any less, or if you're not able to breathe beyond 37 meter depth, it will cause lung squeeze and will cause severe hypoxia. The diving mammals are protected because the lungs of the seals and the whales are made differently. They collapse completely. The thoracic cage is more elastic. And there are persons of venous sinuses which help in shunting. Talking about immersion up to the neck in water, it reduces the vital capacity by about 10%. And with depth and breathing gas density itself increases because the gas is pressurized and supplied to you. 
So the flow is turbulent. There is increased energy required for work of breathing itself, which causes fatigue of the respiratory muscle, and it decreases the maximum breathing capacity. In scuba diving, there is an additional dead space, which is because of the, uh, the uh, amount of gas which is held in the tubes and the resistance, and also the placement of the cylinder where it is located in center of your body. The lighter gases have a different problem. They dissolve faster in plasma, and they also have to be taken into consideration while calculating the decomposition requirement. In thermal homeostasis, it is very clear that diving is a hypothermic environment. We lose heat by conduction, convection, and by radiation. There is shunting of blood. There is respiratory losses, which is a, which is an insensible heat loss. There is loss of insulation capacity of the skin, which is constantly submerged. And because of this, the divers use neoprene suits and hot water suits. And the breathing gases are rewarmed. They are supplied at as close to body temperature as possible. In underwater vision, we have issues of objects appearing closer, larger, distorted. All this is because of the refractive index of the water at the water cornea interface. The field of vision is narrowed and the color perception is altered because some lights like red are absorbed more than certain other colors. In underwater sound, sound travels four times faster. There is an effect of Doppler, and there is also an additional noise which comes in because of breathing in the helmet. There is a constant pumping noise, and the bone conduction because of wet work when the body is in, in constant touch with a metallic surface. It's almost impossible to pinpoint a source of sound underwater. And when you talk after breathing helium, your voice sounds different. It's called the Donal duck effect. I'm rushing through these slides. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just supposed to you know, compress as much as possible within the time given. Now we talk about the physical effects of high pressure. This simply brings us to a topic called as barotrauma. I'll be covering this and passing on the rest of the topics to Dr. Rohit. Barotraumas are defined by the Boyle's law. The volume of the gas decreases with descent because the pressure increases. And the vice versa happens. The volume of the gas expands as you ascend. There are natural air containing cavities in human body, including the paranasal sinuses, the middle ear, the lungs. They need to be vented. During descent, the air should enter the cavity to make good the volume reduction. If not, the pressure difference between the, the space and the surrounding depth leads to the tissue destruction called barotrauma. We'll just see what barotrauma looks like. Barotraumas happen as close to the surface as we can imagine because the largest pressure changes take place at the closest of the depth. As we go from Surface, one atmosphere pressure to 10 meters, the pressure doubles. So the, the volume reduces by 50% closest to the surface. Barotromas can happen in various places. Ear, the lungs, the paranasal sinuses, the face mask squeeze, the gastrointestinal system, and the dentine. The face mask squeeze looks like because of the air trapped in the, uh, in the face mask that the diver wears. If it is not vented, it tends to cause blotching of the skin by breaking the capillaries, the subcutaneous capillaries. Middle ear barotrauma is the is a standalone example that we need to know because it's the commonest ailment that you see in diving. It's because of the failure to equalize pressure in the middle ear. The middle ear is naturally connected by the eustachian tube, but there are numerous conditions where the eustachian tube is blocked, the most common being common cold. And when the eustachian tube is blocked, the middle ear constantly reduces its volume, shrinks, and pulls the tympanic membrane internally till such time that the elastic limit of the tympanic membrane is reached and the membrane bursts and the middle ear is uh, hemorrhage. The treatment of middle ear barotrauma is equally simple. No diving till it uh, is healed. Keep the ears dry. You use systemic and nasal decongestants and analgesic. Most tympanic membrane perforations heal within three weeks. And the diver needs to be examined for concomitant inner ear barotrauma by doing a, an audiometry. Lastly, we talk about the barotrauma of the lung. Lungs are also air containing spaces. They are also naturally communicated to the external environment, but in certain conditions, when you hold our breath by closing the glottis, the lung gets converted into a closed air space. 
The physical damage can happen because of overextension, because of rapid pressurization. The buildup of pressure inside bursts, causing a collapse in pneumothorax. And some of the air which is released raises up as bubbles and produces subcutaneous emphysema limited by the, the investing fascia of the neck. And if with real bad luck, the air enters the pulmonary venous system and causes gas on body. Any of these can happen. All of these can happen together if you're really, really terribly having a bad day. So we just quickly talked about um, how these things happen. First is the ruptured alveoli causing pneumothorax and tracking up and becoming surgical emphysema. And if any of these leak into a blood vessel, it can cause an air embolism. Why does this happen? It's because of voluntarily breath holding during diving, the, the glottis closure, or it can be involuntary in, in cases of panic, in cases of seizures underwater, or if there is a sudden blow to your breathing supply, which causes a back pressure effect onto your lungs, or if there are air trapping lesions in the lungs, which cause lungs to become scarred and more liable, more friable to rupture in case of cyst and emphysematous movement. The symptoms are uh, listed down here. There's chest pain, bloody throat, shortness of breath, change to voice reputation, unconsciousness, and sometimes death, if, especially if it is a gas involved. The signs of pneumothorax include tension pneumothorax, which we already know as clinicians. The on-site first aid involves lying the casualty down, administering pure oxygen, 100% oxygen, as much as possible for the time it takes for him to be, to be evacuated to a decompression facility. It's also important to treat him for shock by giving IV fluids. The cerebral artery gas embolism, which is a dreaded complication when the embolism tracks into the pulmonary veins and goes into the central circulation. If it gets filtered into the pulmonary circulation in the small vessels, we are still lucky. But a massive bubble load may cross over to the pulmonary veins and transfer to the left-sided circulation and get lodged into the, into the cerebral artery. Patient presents with rapid onset neurological symptoms. It can happen as soon as surfacing, or it can present as unconsciousness or seizures underwater. The victim may drown. There will be a lucid interval, then subsequently deterioration. I take a break now, and I'll be handing over the uh, data to Dr. Rohit. If there are any questions, I would either answer them now, or we can keep it till the end as the moderators choose, and then compile them, and then we'd answer them together. One last click, sir. OK. Mm. Mughal. Can you hear me? I read you clearly, sir. Okay, so thanks, Satan Gokul. That was a very uh, succinct and lucid uh, presentation of a rather complex topic. Gas laws can be uh, uh, rather overwhelming. Of course, the anesthetists, uh, Dr. Vidya, I'm sure, and a whole lot of anesthetists would be best suited to understand what Gokul was talking about. Uh, the rest of us shall continue the struggle. Uh, but thank you uh, for that talk. And uh, so we'll move on now to Rohit Verma. Uh, Rohit is a serving officer. He's a surgeon commander. He's right now the principal medical officer at the Indian Naval ship Abhimanyu, which is a diving base uh, of Bombay. Uh, he's a marine medical specialist with 14 years of experience. And uh, interestingly, he's been posted in two very uh, niche appointments. One is a submarine rescue vessel, INS Nirikshak. Uh, Lord shall tell us something about this. Uh, it's a very special ship that we have. Uh, and of course, he's also been at the diving school in Kochi, where divers train. And that's probably where our Indian Navy divers do the deepest dives ever. Uh, and uh, I do know for a fact that Rohit has covered, provided medical cover, the advice, and the backup and logistics for uh, the deepest dive done by the Indian Naval Divers uh, to date. Uh, Rohit is an avid academic. He's been editor of the Journal of Marine Medical Society. He's been a secretary of the Marine Medical Society, has a large number of publications to his credit. And not to forget his multifaceted personality. I promised you all three are multifaceted people. Well, Rohit is a avid photographer too. Uh, if you log into his blog, you'll see lovely photographs of uh, birds and natural beauty. So over to Rohit. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, I begin right away. My topic is diving illness. And uh, I take on from uh, where uh, Surgeon Captain Gokul has left. Covering with an overview, a brief touch on drowning and hypoxia, a little word about gas toxicities and inert gas narcosis, a slightly uh, comprehensive uh, exposition on decompression sickness, and a word about long-term effects of diving. So what is it about diving illness which uh, separates it from other types of illness? It is just that illness which happens to divers underwater. Yes, it is that. And there are certain major uh, factors in causing diving illnesses, and I'll be briefly touching on them. The most important are obviously the environment factors. And the most important environment for a diver is, of course, water and salt water. And as has already been described in the previous presentation, it causes salt water aspiration syndrome. It causes drowning. Temperature, the water temperature uh, is a very important factor in causing hypothermia. Even in waters which are tropical waters like our Indian waters, there is a significant chance of causing hypothermia. Now, majority of the diving activity takes place at remote locations because that is where the fun of the diving is or that is where the commercial diving activity, the gas and oil are. So if there is any diving illness, it entails a long evacuation to the nearest medical facility. And again, that is another uh, peculiar feature of managing any diving illness. And of course, there are marine animals which uh, share the space with the diver and they can cause injury. However, for this particular presentation, I will not be dealing in any detail on that. Diving is a very equipment intensive activity, almost like an aircraft, although not as much. Uh, so the skill and familiarity with the piece of equipment is very important. So any lack of familiarity, any mistake can rapidly lead to injury, illness and death. In this, I would like to touch upon buoyancy. While diving, one needs to lose buoyancy to go down and gain buoyancy while coming up. So there is this very careful play of uh, gaining and losing or rather losing and gaining buoyancy. And if there is any error or any uh, mismatch in this, it can lead to uh, rapidly lead to issues such as a rapid ascent because if suddenly the diver uh, uh, increases his buoyancy, he can suddenly shoot up. And as we saw in the previous presentation, it can easily lead to pulmonary barotrauma, arterial gas embolism, and of course, death. And of course, because of the complexity and perplexity of the equipment, there is always the chance of equipment malfunction, which can lead to, uh, which can lead to injury. Pressure, the effect of pressure is there, which is unique factor of diving illness, which has been adequately dealt with in the previous presentation. Hence, I will not be dealing on it. As in any other illness, there are individual factor, factors. So elderly age, male gender are more prone for all sorts of diving illnesses. Obesity is an independent risk factor for causing uh, decompression sickness. And of course, the diving skill of, dive, of the diver and his mental makeup is perhaps the greatest individual factor which determines which diver will get a diving illness or will sustain a diving injury. And perhaps which diver who's performing a similar or same dive will get away with it. So diving skill is in the end is what uh, perhaps can save a diver from a fatality or any diving injury. And of course, there are dive related factors. The greater the depth and the greater the duration, the greater is the chance of injury, particularly of decompression sickness. And because of the plethora of the breathing gas, uh, which is there, which is by itself uh, a great topic in itself, which is very complex, diver is not breathing to which his body is used to, that is air. So there are various mixtures of nitrogen and oxygen, helium and oxygen and helium, nitrogen and oxygen. So all these are uh, an important factor in causing any diving illness. Now briefly coming to drowning, which is uh, basically we tend to think that any death happening in water is drowning, which is more factually correct also because ultimately any of the illnesses which I will be talking about subsequently ultimately leads to drowning, may lead to drowning, and will be seen as a case of drowning. And in, if you see a news report on it, you will see, you will find that so and so diver drowned in so and so location, lake or sea or place. And it is very difficult 
in after drowning to determine what exactly caused uh, the sequence of events which led to this drowning hence uh, it is very important to prevent uh, diving illness rather than manage it the second aspect which i want to touch upon is that it is uh, it is a common notion that all divers are skilled swimmers as uh, colonel sp also touched in his introductory talk talk it's a it's a it's almost a fact however there is a large community of recreational divers who are whose swim, swimming skills might not be adequate or even zero and that by itself can lead to uh, drowning that can lead to various other uh, diving illnesses and that can lead to any evolving situation any problem the diver is not able to react appropriately and can get into trouble and even uh, might also die now coming to hypoxia as has been adequately dealt with in the previous presentation the since the diver is diving in water he has to carry his own breathing gas supply which can be compressed air which can be a variety of other diving mixtures now this breathing gas supply is theoretically a limited supply and this can run out either because of over usage or because of some equipment uh, procedures and that situation is called as low on gas or out of gas situation and that will lead to hypoxia and that will immediate that will uh, lead to a sequence of events which can lead to death if not if the diver is not recovered immediately from the water however it is interesting to note that this low on gas out of gas situation is rather rare because in divers who have suffered from hypoxia when their breathing gas cylinders were examined majority there was adequate gas for the diver to come up so why has why has the diver suffered from hypoxia it is mostly because of lack of training and following incorrect procedure so the diver has not perhaps opened the right valve and made himself available the uh, the diving gas which is adequate on his back in the cylinder which might seem to be a very common sense thing but it is the lack of common sense and it is a lack of training and it is lack of skill which ultimately leads to issues and problems and even fatality of course there is the issue of equipment malfunction where although there is adequate gas however it is not pumped to the uh, diver because of some equipment malfunction and the diver suffers hypoxia so this this twin of hypoxia and drowning is always a constant com companion in any diving activity and ultimately as clinicians as primary first aid givers or as uh, uh, clinicians in a hospital who is treating a diving emergency these two things management of hypoxia uh, correction of hypoxia and management of drowning these two should be primary in our minds while dealing with any diving casualty now coming to gas toxicities now oxygen which is an essential went to the diver at a heightened at an elevated partial pressure now this elevated partial pressure of oxygen can cause various types of toxicities primary being the cns oxygen toxicity which is of the acute type now each individual has got variable threshold for tolerating the enhanced partial pressure of oxygen however for uh, for as a statistical average we can say that a pressure of 2.8 atmospheres or in common terms meters of sea water if you are diving with 100% oxygen that is the depth to which you can dive beyond that the partial pressure of oxygen in will cause in majority of people some degree of oxygen toxicity so oxygen toxicity is seen in the setting of 100% oxygen diving as well as it is seen in the treatment it can be seen in the treatment of decompression sickness where 100% oxygen is used to treat decompression sickness at an at a very significantly high partial pressure it commonly the most common symptom of and the most severe symptom of oxygen toxicity is seizures underwater and one can imagine a person who is having seizure underwater can lose the mouthpiece which can lead to ingress of water into the his airways and can rapidly lead to drowning and death therefore more importantly than treating oxygen toxicity is it is important to know that the diver has uh, has an adequate individual threshold for oxygen toxicity number 1 number 2 the gas which he is breathing has got uh, has got an optimum partial pressure of oxygen and the management is of course ascent 
from the from that depth which will reduce the partial pressure of oxygen and removal removal from water and of course institution of first aid measure in terms of uh, cpr and uh, uh, providing a patent airway to the diver coming to carbon dioxide toxicity it is exclusively seen in a type of diving which is called closed circuit diving wherein the breathed out gas is reintroduced into the breathing circuit through a carbon dioxide scrubber which my previous colleague has said as soda lime now in certain situations this soda lime might not work is of faulty quality or is, there is can be an equipment malfunction and there is an increasing amount of carbon dioxide in the breathing in circuit as well so it is usually gradually in onset it is manifested by commonly as a whole head headache and if not addressed immediately it can rapidly lead to coma and can even be fatal so it is man if once a diver starts experiencing a headache a dull aching headache in while doing a close circuit diving he should be aware and you as a diving physician or as a primary physician should be aware that he is suffering from carbon dioxide toxicity and he should be recovered from water as as is as uh, fast as is safely possible and he is managed by supportive measures which is primarily airway management and providing 100% oxygen carbon monoxide toxicity is a fairly lethal however uh, it it occurs because of uh, contamination of the breathing gas supply of the diver with carbon monoxide the source is the air compressors which are used to fill the cylinder of the divers now if there is uh, these air compressors uh, can contaminate the uh, diving gas uh, the divers breathing gas then it can lead to carbon monoxide toxicity it usually has no symptoms and it is rapidly fatal so prevention is the only management the uh, divers breathing gas should be very meticulous there should be it should be ensured that there is no contamination in the uh, in the in his supply to avoid carbon monoxide toxicity coming to a very peculiar diving like illness is nitrogen narcosis and in several hollywood movies and in several novels it has been romanticized so it is basically because of the physical effect of pressurized nitrogen so suffice to say that any diving which is conducted in compressed air beyond 35 meters 35 meters and deeper nitrogen narcosis is likely to occur because of the enhanced partial pressure of nitrogen which can act as a narcotic and can diffuse into the uh, various nerves and the uh, nerve junctions and can delay the uh, nerve uh, conduction which leads to loss of judgment behavioral changes coma and if sustained for a longer duration can even lead to death uh, so a diver who is diving to fairly deeper depths particularly deeper than 35 meters there should always be voice communication with the diver and the dive supervisor and the dive physician should always be monitoring the behavioral response of the diver to common commands or common orders which are given by the dive supervisor and if the diver is behaving funny as the divers like to call it then there it he is likely suffering from inert gas narcosis which is nitrogen narcosis and he should be uh, he should be asked to ascend or he should be pulled up which will reduce the partial pressure of nitrogen and which will reduce the effect of nitrogen narcosis and as soon as the diver ascends the effects of uh, elevated effects of partial pressure of nitrogen are gone and this condition is self limiting however if that is not adhered to because of loss of judgment and because of behavioral ch changes the diver can act or can uh, harm himself or can harm his uh, other divers now coming to decompression sickness which is a consequence of something called as henry's law and since captain gokul has covered so many laws i will not uh, cover this law at all uh it 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 is basically because of enhanced dissolution of nitrogen in various body tissues while the diver is diving and once he is as starts ascending this dissolved nitrogen in various body tissues it starts coming out or it starts precipitating out of the body tissues and if this ascent is fast enough this decrease in pressure is fast enough then this precipitation of dissolved nitrogen from the various body tissues occurs in the form of bubbles 
for a lack of a uh, better word we diver, diving physicians still call it bubbles and these bubbles exert mass effect in various body tissues and of course they can exert a biochemical effect on various body tissues now there are some risk factors for this illness of course the dive profile the deeper and the longer the dive the greater is the risk of decompression sickness because that that is the greater is the dissolution of nitrogen in the various body tissues other than this there are individual risk factors and an individual who has got patent for amen ovale is at a higher risk of decompression sickness and obese individual is at a higher risk of decompression sickness and an individual who has suffered some musculoskeletal injury is again likely to develop bubbles at the site of his previous injury and is likely to develop decompression sickness other than that there are some uh, there is an individual propensity for the for some individuals to develop repeated decompression sickness as well there are environmental factors for example lower water temperature can also cause increased chances of decompression sickness It's precipitated in literally all the body systems of the diver the decompression sickness presents with a wide spectrum of symptoms so the common dictum is that any symptom which occurs after a dive can be decompression sickness now in this wide uh, ranging uh, uh, in this wide ranging uh, statement i would like to qualify that majority of the decompression sickness thankfully occur in the musculoskeletal system in which there is uh, pain as well as restriction of movement of the large joints such as hips knees elbows and uh, shoulder joint and in any case of any restriction of movement as well as uh, pain any any joint is should be taken as decompression sickness in addition there can be fairly serious symptoms of decompression sickness in neurological symptoms particularly spinal symptoms in which there can be loss of control over bowel and uh, bladder there can be uh, paresthesia in the lower limbs even paralysis in the lower limbs and it can even have uh, uh, it can ha even have lead to loss of consciousness altered consciousness coma or it can even in very serious cases it can even present with death there are pulmonary symptoms in which there is severe breathlessness and coughing and hemoptysis so we can see that literally all symptom all major systems of the body can have some or the other symptom of decompression sickness thankfully majority of the symptoms are uh, limited to the musculoskeletal system basically uh, pain and restriction uh, of movement of uh, joints so decompression sickness is uh, diagnosed by a high degree of clinical suspicion any history of diving in the previous 72 hours and any symptom decompression sickness should always be in the uh, in the list of di differential diagnosis investigations have very limited role in diagnosing however certain investigation should be conducted such as ct scan chest to rule out any associated bero trauma if there is associated bero trauma then associated management of that pulmonary bero trauma needs to be instituted coagulation pa parameter should be done because if they are deranged because of the presence of bubbles there has been a biochemical reaction which is causing a derangement of coagulation parameters it can be a surrogate marker for the adequacy of the management of decompression sickness because if you have adequately treated decompression sickness these coagulation parameters will start improving with time and you have a baseline uh, on which to work on Cre again creatine kinase can be raised uh, is is conducted is uh, done as, uh, investigated to rule out any rhabdomyolysis if uh, concurrent rhabdomyolysis and if there is rhabdomyolysis that should be managed now coming to management of decompression sickness the on site management is providing 100% oxygen which basically provides the nitrogen which is dissolved in various body tissues to precipitate faster and come out in a manner uh, uh, come out not as bubbles but as microscopic gas which is not likely to cause any uh mass effect or uh, any biochemical reaction in the body therefore any uh, in fact this is a dictum which can be used for majority of diving illnesses that provide 100% oxygen to the victim as soon as he is recovered from water and uh, i think that will uh, that will cater for majority of the illnesses in addition fluids are given the definitive management of decompression sickness is recompression therapy in which 
the diver is again pressurized to a particular depth according to a schedule so that these bubbles which have precipitated are reduced as a consequence of boyle's law and they go back again into the tissue and then which is again a problematic thing because the moment you will reduce the pressure again they are likely to precipitate out so what you have to do is you have to follow a very very slow decompression regimen while providing a very high partial pressure of oxygen so that this uh, this inert gas which has again been forced to get dissolved into the various body tissues is uh, is, is uh, comes out as a microscopic gas and not as bubbles we will see two examples uh, subsequently and of course despite giving recompression therapy if there are any residual symptoms they are treated with hyperbaric oxygen therapy which will be covered by the next speaker now coming to prevention of dcs uh, as has been covered by the previous speaker there is a diving table so basically a diving table is a staggered schedule of the diver to ascend from depth so that the dive, the inert gas which has dissolved in his various body tissues that precipitates as microscopic gas and not as bubbles and does not cause decompression sickness however there is a word of caution here that a diver who has meticulously and religiously followed a diving table a diving regimen is still likely to suffer from decompression sickness it does not provide any 100% guarantee that even after following a diving table the diver will not suffer from decompression sickness therefore as a diving physician or as a physician who is looking at a diving casualty one must in mind that even despite following the diving table if there is a symptom which is falling in the pattern of decompression sickness it is likely to be a decompression sickness now this is a confusing looking table which i have flashed just to give you that uh, one of the standard regimens for giving recompression therapy so what i would like to draw your attention to the fact is that it is about 4 hours 45 minutes long so one can imagine that during this period the diver is shut off in the uh, in the recompression chamber and he has to be catered his other requirements his uh other medical requirements needs to be catered inside the recompression chamber which by itself is a challenge and while he is being recompressed he is given alternatively oxygen 100% oxygen and breaks of air now these breaks of air are given to avoid the cns oxygen toxicity that i spoke previously so one can see that uh, there are alternate periods of longer periods of 100% oxygen then a 5 minute break of 100 uh, of air again 100% oxygen and so on and so forth and then he is gradually ascended to back to surface uh, that is back to uh, uh, the one atmosphere uh, uh, pressure from the depth to which he is taken now if this does not work there are several other options depending upon the severity and the type of decompression sickness one of which is like a heliox helium and oxygen recompression therapy this is this goes even further it goes for about 7 hours 20 minutes so these are the various armaments which are available to the diving physician to treat decompression sickness which requires tailor made mixtures tailor made breathing mixtures of helium and oxygen and uh, uh, and of course air now coming at last to the long term effects of diving a commercial diver or even a very intrepid uh, recreational diver is not immune from long term effects of diving so typically diving is a very noisy environment which exposes the diver to a high degree of noise and most of the divers if they are not wearing any hearing uh, protection then they suffer from sensory neural hearing loss in the long run to 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 monitor this we typically undertake pure tone audiometry of all our divers and commercial divers every 2 to 5 years to see if they are suffering from any uh, sensory neural hearing loss the other factor is pulmonary oxygen toxicity we have seen earlier the cns oxygen toxicity now the divers because of uh, the peculiarity are exposed to high levels of partial pressure of oxygen in any dive therefore over a period of time this leads to uh, lung damage it leads to uh, decrease in the lung capacity and for this to screen again we have to do the pulmonary function test uh, every 2 to 5 years to see if the divers pulmonary function tests are deteriorating and if they are so 
then as a commercial diver or as a military diver, his diving has to be curtailed or stopped. The other uh, illness is dysbaric osteonecrosis. This is typically seen in divers, commercial divers who, who dive in what are called as tailor-made mixtures. Now, once they uh, dive on tailor-made mixtures, uh, over a period of 10 to 15 years, these uh, uh, this uh, inert gas, they tend to destroy the joints and can cause uh, the uh, destruction of uh, the joint surfaces and cause osteonecrosis and is a fairly debilitating illness. With this, I have finished. And uh, I would like to say that uh, all this might sound very uh, unfamiliar or very, uh, or very uh, difficult, but as a diving physician, it's an exciting journey. All dives are... Uh, uh, new, all dives are new dives, all dives are uh, different dives and even a shallow dive or even the deepest dive can uh, is a learning experience as a diving physician and I even in this year, uh, even three months back when I have uh, after, uh, after seeing so many saturation dives of over 100 meters, 200 meters, I still got to learn uh, every time about uh, a diving peculiarity or about a diving illness from the divers, they are the best teachers about diving illnesses. So with this, I would like to conclude and uh, hand over back to Colonel SP. Thank you, Rohit. That was a, a very good exposition of the various ailments that are attendant upon diving. What I gathered from this is that toxicities are an effect of compression and decompression sickness, as the name implies, an effect of decompression. Right? And... Uh, of course, oxygen toxicity is something very interesting, as Rohit pointed out right at the end. It has a cumulative effect over the years, uh, but it can have cumulative effects in shorter terms. For the critical care specialist, it's something to keep in mind when they put people on high flow nasal cannula, delivery of oxygen, 100%, or let's say even 50%. 100% oxygen becomes pulmonary toxic at 24 hours. 50% oxygen would be pulmonary toxic at, 50, uh, at 48 hours on and so forth. So the concept of oxygen toxicity is very important in clinical and critical care medicine and must be kept both in mind. What we get from driving medicine. Of course. Uh, so now to round off the talk, we have Surgeon Commander Chaitanya Kodange. Now Chaitanya is uh, my classmate from MBBS and a very dear friend. Uh, so it's going to be difficult to introduce him. Because when you think of a dear friend, you think of all the wrong things to say about friend. Uh, there are so many secrets between us. Uh, so I shall try and refrain from telling you those and tell you only good things about him. So uh, Chaitanya is an underwater medicine specialist. He's an MD in psychiatry and he's an excellent psychiatrist. Let me tell you that. A highly respected one in the services. And has a postgraduate diploma in hospital administration. He's an excellent academic. Whatever course he does, he scores more than 90% uh, marks, except for when he was with us. So I guess we were the bad influence. We couldn't allow him to do very well in his MBBS or score 90% in his MBBS. So right now, he's a consultant hyperbaric medicine specialist and a specialist in wound care at the King Hamad University Hospital in Bahrain. Uh, he has been an instructor at the Institute of Naval Medicine where he's uh, taken charge of the training of Indian and foreign naval officers. He was part of the expert group for designing the CBME curriculum for the newly started course in MD in uh, underwater diving and hyperbaric medicine. Uh, of course, needless to say, multiple publications to his name. And uh, what I must not forget to tell you is that Chaitanya is a submariner, he's a diver, and he's a skydiver. So there's no element of the on the... Uh, face of this earth that he's left unexplored. Uh, and uh, that's something fantastic. Uh, over to Chetan. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, thank you, SP, for the kind uh, introduction. And at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Vidya Mohan Ram, for giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts about uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy which I'll be speaking on today. So I propose to cover this under the following heads, a brief introduction and a history, its definition, the physiological effects, the indication and contraindications, how we evaluate the patient, the treatment protocol, side effects, and what are the hurdles we face in the practice of uh, HBOT. 
So as we all know that uh, Joseph Priestley discovered oxygen in 1774 and it was named as oxygen by Lavoisier in 1778. But the use of hyperbaric air therapy started way back in 1662 uh, when Henshaw, who was an English clergyman and a physician, started using compressed air to treat patients for a variety of ailments. And for this, uh, this chamber which he created was called as a domicilium. And because uh, the reputation of his therapy uh, showed some uh, good results, uh, this soon spread across to uh, across to France. And there, Junod, uh, he developed these uh, hyperbaric chambers. In fact, these were designed by James Watt, uh, the inventor of the steam engine. Uh, so Junod and Burton again popularized these hyperbaric chambers in the 1870s in uh, Europe. But it was uh, Dr. Orwell Cunningham uh, who brought it into prominence in the US in the 1920s till 1930s. Uh, what he noticed was that during the Spanish influenza epidemic, the people who were living in the valley, uh, that is at a lower uh, altitude, they were suffering more uh, severe forms of the epidemic than those, uh, uh, they were better off than those living in the highland. So he thought that it was maybe due to the pressure change and he used the hyperbaric uh, chambers for that. And since he got good results, he started uh, promoting this and he soon constructed the largest ever hyperbaric hospital, which was called as a steel uh, ball in, Cleve, uh, in Ohio. And this was almost 62 feet in diameter. It had five uh, floors with uh, around 70 rooms and it had all the amenities of uh, a five-star hotel, but it was using compressed air and he was treating it for a variety of ailments. But when he was told to offer evidence of his uh, benefit to the by the American Medical Association, which he refused to do and he refused to share the data. And there was some uh, mechanical failure which led to a decompression and death of a few patients. So this went into disrepute and uh, in 1937, this whole thing was dismantled and used as a, a steel for the war efforts in the Second World War. But it was Benke and Shaw in uh, 1937 who first used hyperbaric oxygen therapy for treatment of decompression sickness. And another landmark was uh, Churchill Davidson in 1954 to 1956 who used hyperbaric oxygen to increase the radio sensitivity of certain tumors, especially a breast carcinoma. And uh, the father of modern day hyperbaric medicine is this Dutch cardiovascular surgeon. He was a pediatric cardiac surgeon called Ite Borema, who uh, realized that uh, using hyperbaric oxygen can help patients tolerate surgeries because this was the era of uh, before the heart lung bypass machines. So by the hyperbaric oxygen, uh, the oxygen which gets dissolved in the plasma could keep the patient alive without even the need for blood. So he's actually uh, done a lot of things and he created one of the largest operating theaters, hyperbaric operating theaters. And he operated uh, successfully on numerous uh, patients. So this led to the popularization of hyperbaric oxygen therapy and the undersea medical society was formed in 1967. In the 70s, there was a rapid expansion of these facilities in Japan and USSR, erstwhile USSR. In 1983, the American College of Hyperbaric Medicine was formed and in 86, they added the word hyperbaric. So now it's known as UHMS, the Undersea Hyperbaric Medical Society, which is one of the uh, largest such societies and uh, followed the world over. In 1988, there was the formation of the International Society of Hyperbaric Medicine. Uh, since then, it has been rapidly expanding and uh, presently, the maximum number of HBOT chambers in the world is in China. So uh, seeing the increasing popularity of HBOT, the Journal of Critical Care Medicine in one of the review articles correctly mentioned that uh, HBO is not just a movie channel anymore. So how do we define HBOT? This is uh, the therapeutic administration of 100% oxygen at environmental pressures greater than one atmosphere absolute. 
and this administration involves placing the uh, patient in an airtight chamber, increasing the pr pressure while the patient is breathing 100% oxygen. So a lot of people claim, you know, they will put some device around a limb or something and give topical oxygen and increase the pressure there and say that that's uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but that's incorrect. Because for HBOT, uh, the patient should be in a chamber and breathing oxygen. And it's not just the local topical application of oxygen, which constitutes hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So the effects of hyperbaric uh, oxygen therapy are based on gas laws and diving physics, which has been covered extensively by my previous speakers. So uh, broadly, they can be divided into two effects. That is the direct physical effects of the increased pressure and the indirect biological effects of increased pressure. So the direct uh, physical effects of increased pressure, you all heard the Boyle's law, Dalton's law, Grand's law, Henry's law. So what these basically do is they lead to a decrease in the bubble size, which helps to relieve the air or the gas embolism. It leads to increased oxygen tension and thus this relieves the hypoxia. And it also helps us to predict the toxic side effects of various gas toxicities. Now coming to the indirect or the biological effects of increased oxygen pressure, uh, this leads to increased oxygen tension in the plasma and thus it helps to relieve the hypoxia. Uh, it promotes vasoconstriction leading to decrease in the edema. It increases fibroblast proliferation and collagen synthesis. It promotes angiogenesis and it enhances the leukocyte function and attenuates reperfusion injury. Now, all these factors are very important and help to promote wound healing and tissue repair. Uh, and why am I emphasizing this? Because one of the major uses of hyperbaric oxygen therapy is in uh, wound healing. So this slide here shows the physiological effects of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. This is the normal blood flow wherein uh, the oxygen is being carried by the red blood cells and the oxygen diffuses out into the tissues. But in case there is a compromise or occluded blood flow here due to any injury, disease, or a blood clot, uh, the tissues beyond this blockade area, they break down due to the lack of oxygen. So when we give hyperbaric oxygen, the oxygen gets dissolved in the plasma and the oxygen is able to uh, diffuse out and the oxygen is provided to these tissues. And when this hyperbaric oxygen continues for a certain period of time, it promotes neurovascular regeneration. So you can see newer blood vessels are forming and thus this promotes more delivery of oxygen and thus the hypoxia is completely relieved. So what are the indications for HBOT? Unfortunately, there are no universally accepted set of indications. Various international, national, uh, regional HBOT authorities have their own different set of indications which are approved. Like the Japanese society has around 20, China recommends 53 conditions and Russia has up to 70 conditions. But the UHMS, which is a worldwide body and most followed, uh, they have 14 indications and these are based on peer reviewed uh, research. And also the insurance companies have agreed to provide uh, insurance for these medical conditions. And there are also a lot of off-label indications which are followed and different centers have their own set of off-label indications. So coming to the UHMS uh, set of indications and these are in alphabetical order. So the first one is air or gas embolism. Then second is a rubric of arterial insufficiencies which includes central retinal arterial occlusion and enhancement of healing of selected problem wounds. So this actually comprises almost 60 to 70% of uh, clinical HBOT work. Then we have carbon monoxide poisoning, clostridial myonecrosis of gas gangrene, uh, compromised grafts and flaps, crush injuries, compartment syndrome, and then of course decompression sickness, then delayed effects of uh, radiation. Uh, that is delayed radiation injuries. Then in 2011, the latest addition was this idiopathic sudden onset sensory neural hearing loss. It's useful in intracranial abscess, necrotizing soft tissue infections, a chronic refractory osteomyelitis, severe anemia, especially due to blood loss and thermal burns. 
One important caveat to remember is that HBOT is not the primary or the sole treatment modality in all these conditions, except in maybe decompression sickness, air gas embolism, carbon monoxide poisoning, and gas gangrene. So HBOT is mainly used as an adjunctive therapy. So these clinical indications are based on a sound physiological basis. So as we have seen that the decrease in bubble size will help in decompression sickness, arterial gas embolism, the hyperoxygenation which it produces uh, relieves the hypoxia and it's useful in DCS, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, crush injury, uh, compromised grafts and flaps and in anemia. It causes vasoconstriction which again helps in crush injuries and in thermal burns. It promotes fibroblast proliferation and collagen synthesis. Thus, it's useful in uh, dealing with problem wounds and effects of delayed radiation injury. The toxin inhibition, which it promotes, uh, is useful in clostridial myonecrosis of gas gangrene. It promotes angiogenesis, so it's useful in wounds, compromised grafts and flaps, and radiation. It enhances the leukocyte oxidative killing. It reduces the leukocyte adherence. It reduces the lipid peroxidation. And finally, it also promotes antibiotic synergy. So this is useful in necrotizing soft tissue infection and chronic refractory osteomyelitis. So it potentiates the action of certain group of antibiotics, especially the aminoglycosides, the furoquinolones, and beta-lactams. Now, coming to the off-label indications, this is a very controversial topic because uh, a lot of centers have their own a set of uh, off-label indications for which they provide. Uh, one of the latest, which has been approved by the Veterans Administration in uh, US and they are offering in many states, is uh, traumatic brain injury or concussion, especially from uh, blast injuries and for post-traumatic stress disorder. So a lot of insurance companies there have agreed to uh, pay for the HBOT uh, therapies for these conditions but it's being used extensively in uh, patients of stroke, uh, uh, both uh, in chronic stroke, as well as in some centers they're using in the acute phase of stroke. Uh, it's used in sports injuries, and you may have seen uh, a lot of these top footballers have uh, hyperbaric chambers installed in their home to, uh, to promote early recovery from injuries. It's useful in facial palsy, cerebral palsy, it's being used in children with autism, uh, in patients with migraine, fibromyalgia. It's used extensively in cosmetic surgery, both before and after the procedure. Uh, it's being used with good effect in a lot of patients with spinal cord injuries, peripheral nerve injuries, and in organ transplant, both before and after the transplant. And it's increasingly being used in stem cell research. A brief word about HBOT in uh, problem wounds. So problem wounds are defined as those which are not uh, healing as per the accepted rate of, uh, as per the uh, expected rate of healing. Uh, that is uh, generally within 12 weeks, they should heal. But in case they are not, then they're categorized as problem wounds. And this is a major healthcare challenge uh, worldwide. So is HBOT the answer for all wounds? No. So we need to select those wounds which are likely to benefit from HBOT. So for this, uh, we use what is called as transcutaneous oxygen monitoring, which are basically electrodes which are placed around uh, the wound. And these help us to uh, ascertain the tissue oxygen tension that is uh, around the wound. And using that uh, and selecting the patient, it provides almost a 74% accuracy in the predictive value of HBOT in wound healing. So the patients with a TCPO2 value less than 40 are potential candidates for HBOT. And when we combine this with the appropriate wound care, there is definitely improved wound healing outcomes. So this here is a flow chart which shows that uh, how do we select the problem wounds which are likely to uh, benefit from HBOT. So first we do this TCOM wherein the patient, uh, the tissue oxygen tension around the wound area is measured when the patient is breathing normal air at surface. If it is less than 40, then the patient is a potential candidate for HBOT. But if it is more than 40, 
then the wound is not hypoxic and then hbot is not likely to be cost effective so if it is less than 40 then we make the patient breathe 100% oxygen for around 15 minutes at surface and then in case the tcpo2 increases to more than 100 mm then definitely he is likely to benefit from hbot if it remains between 40 and 100 then we increase the pressure and give what is called as a hyperbaric challenge uh, wherein we measure these uh, tcpo2 values at 2.4 ata and there if the tcpo2 increases to more than 200 mm of mercury then hbot is likely to be beneficial but it's not that even if the readings are less that the patients will not benefit a uh, lot of them do benefit and then we have to decide on a case to case basis that whether the patient is likely to benefit or not coming to diabetic foot ulcers which are a major portion of these uh, problem wounds or non healing wounds so hbot has been proven to be effective for a lot of these ischemic infected uh, diabetic foot ulcers uh, wagner grade 3 or even worse Uh, again here i would like to emphasize that proper patient selection is uh, paramount there should be adequate vascular supply because if there is no uh, vascular supply itself the uh, oxygen will not reach uh, to the wound site and thus it's unlikely to be beneficial so we use a handheld 8 megahertz doppler to at the bed side to ascertain the vascular supply and we combine it with the uh, transcutaneous oxygen monitoring to assess and find out which patients are most likely to benefit so when we combine wound care and hbot this results in improved wound healing outcomes and uh, reduced amputation rates which is uh, the important goal coming to the absolute contraindications of hbot there is basically only one which i would say that is a untreated tension pneumothorax because this can lead to a cardio respiratory collapse as per boyle's law uh, certain uh, chemotherapeutic agents such as bleomycin cisplatin sulfamylons are supposed to have a deleterious effect but uh, latest review says that it may not be so a uh, disulfiram uh, it blocks the superoxide dismutase and is protective against oxygen toxicity so potentially it can uh, promote uh, central nervous system oxygen toxicity so ideally the patient should be tapered and stopped from uh, disulfiram during the hbot coming to the relative contraindications uh, there are quite a few but we do a risk benefit analysis the most common being asthma because that can lead uh, to air trapping and pneumothorax Uh, claustrophobia or anxiety because it's a closed chamber uh, some pacemakers patients with pacemakers previously uh, were not taken up but nowadays most of the pacemakers and uh, a lot of these epidural pump machines uh, they are certified to be hyperbaric safe uh, pregnancy again is a contra uh, relative contraindication but it has been used when the mother's life is in danger like especially in cases with carbon monoxide poisoning and uh, mostly there have been no negative effects on the fetus seizures as well as high fever uh, lower the seizure threshold and make the patient more liable for seizures uh, so how do we evaluate the patient sorry the patients can come to the uh, uh, department and uh, uh, by a referral a lot of new patients nowadays are self referred or walk in after gaining information through the internet and then we take and i encourage such patients we take a detailed history and a thorough general and systemic examination with special emphasis on ent respiratory and cardiovascular fitness the only investigations we normally ask for are a chest x ray pa and a ecg but uh, depending on the clinical condition we might ask for additional investigations as required in case of absolute contraindication then patient is not taken up but uh, with a relative contraindication we carry out risk benefit analysis uh, then the treatment modality and the treatment protocol is explained to the patient and uh, informed consent taken prior to commencing the therapy so what is the treatment protocol so depending on the indication the clinical condition of the patient the spot treatment protocol is planned by the diving physician 
The treatment depth generally ranges from 1.5 ATA to 2.8 ATA, which is uh, equivalent of five meters of water depth up to 18 meters of water depth. And the time duration can range from anywhere to 60 to 90 minutes. But as Rohit mentioned, that for cases of decompression sickness, uh, the tables can range from uh, two hours, 15 minutes to four hours, 45 minutes and seven hours, 20 minutes or even longer. Uh, the endpoints for the various indications vary and depending on the clinical outcomes, we uh, plan and discuss and review with the patients regularly and decide how many number of sessions uh, the patient would require. So this here shows you that what a typical treatment table would look like. The patient is compressed uh, within say two, uh, uh, two minutes and 15 seconds, then reach the treatment depth where he breathes 100% uh, oxygen for 30 minutes, followed by a five minute air break and three such sessions are given. And then he's brought back to the surface. What are the potential complications or side effects? Luckily, this is a very safe uh, uh, treatment modality with very few complications. The most uh, common one is a middle ear barotrauma, which can happen when the patient is not able to clear his ears by doing the valsalva. Uh, we can have other forms of barotrauma such as sinus, dental, or pulmonary barotrauma. But if we explain all this to the patient and screen them properly, we can avoid it. Uh, there is a lens morphological change, especially with prolonged number of treatments. Uh, it causes myopia, which is reversible. Uh, there are reports of increased uh, cataract formation with prolonged number of treatments. And as Rohit mentioned, uh, one of the most dreaded complication is a uh, central nervous system oxygen toxicity resulting in a seizure. Luckily, the incidence is very low. It's around 0.7 per 10,000 uh, treatments. Uh, pulmonary oxygen toxicity can be avoided by screening and giving breaks between the HBOT sessions. A bit about uh, hyperbaric facilities and the training. So normally we provide uh, the HBOT in either monoplace or multi-place chambers. Uh, these chambers need to be specially designed, constructed and certified to certain standards such as the PVHO that is the pressure vessel for human occupancy and uh, there are regulatory agencies which uh, lay down these uh, rules and regulations and all HBOT facilities ideally should be accredited and inspected regularly for adherence to the safety standards. Now, ideally, HBOT should be prescribed and supervised by qualified physicians with appropriate training. Unfortunately, there are very few formal training programs. Uh, some of the few are in US. Uh, Turkey has a MD program, Russia has an MD program, uh, South Africa has a MSc in Barrow Medical Sciences. In India, luckily, the Indian Navy had taken the lead and way back in the early 1980s, they commenced with a program of uh, Diploma in Marine Medicine, which was a full uh, two-year program. And this included uh, hyperbaric medicine as one of the core components. And as has been mentioned, uh, the MD, a three-year MD in marine medicine has commenced from this academic year in the Institute of Naval Medicine at our Naval Hospital Ashwini in Mumbai. Just to show you, uh, this is the multi-place chamber in our uh, hospital. So this is an eight-man multi-place chamber wherein we can treat up to eight patients at a time. Uh, this whole chamber is compressed with air and the patients breathe oxygen either through a mask or through a hood, uh, which you can see in these so multiple patients can be treated. There is generally an inside attendant who is a nurse to look after the patients and assist them. And the chamber operator is out, outside and he can monitor them by video or audio and he monitors the microclimate here and the various parameters. And these are monoplace chambers. In monoplace chambers, the whole uh, chamber is compressed uh, by 100% oxygen. So the patient breathes normally without any mask. And normally one patient is treated at a time and the attendant is positioned outside. So I've spoken so much about this, but why isn't HBOT so popular and so widespread? Uh, some of the main reasons are the high capital cost involved in setting up a HBOT facility. And because of the high cost, there are very few such centers and there is lack of access to HBOT facilities for most patients. 
And there's also a lack of awareness amongst healthcare professionals about the benefit of HBOT. And hopefully with some lectures like this, uh, we should be able to increase some awareness. And of course, we need more research into a lot of conditions which are likely to benefit from HBOT. And finally, in this era of modern day evidence-based medicine, there is lack of double blind randomized control studies in the field of HBOT. And why does this happen? Uh, this is mainly because of uh, technical issues that how do we blind the patients or carry out a sham treatment. For all this, we need special chamber designs, which has to be planned at the initial uh, construction and uh, installation phase itself. And that leads to increased costs. Next is the financial. Obviously, there's no pharma support because oxygen is freely available, not very expensive. Uh, then the high cost of HBOT treatments then there is no medical reimbursement by uh, the insurance companies for a lot of uh, medical conditions. So the patients are hesitant to pay themselves and get included in studies. And finally, uh, there is a lack of universally accepted indications. Uh, finally, just a small word about the role of uh, HBOT in COVID-19. Uh, many of you may have read about this, that HBOT was recommended. This was basically based on a Chinese study with five patients where they said that the patients who were requiring ventilation, uh, they improved because it corrects the hypoxemia. So the UHMS and the European Society had constituted committees to look into it. And uh, they decided that they did not recommend it routine use because there were a lot of concerns uh, at that time about exposing others to COVID, the decontamination uh, procedures for the chamber and the surrounding areas, and especially the increased risk of barotrauma, especially pulmonary barotrauma, because the lungs are mainly affected in these patients. Uh, but now there is a different category of patients who are termed as the long haulers, who are having the persistent uh, symptoms of COVID. Uh, most of them are uh, neuro, uh, neuro and neuropsychiatric uh, manifestations. And for these patients, HBOT has been found to be beneficial and a lot of uh, European countries are offering them. And I have also had the opportunity to treat a couple with uh, good results. So to conclude, uh, HBOT has a long list of indications, but it is not the panacea for all ailments. The practice of HBOT should be on a sound physiological basis. Uh, there is a need for increased awareness amongst the healthcare professionals so that this valuable treatment, adjunctive treatment modality can be used well. And definitely there is a need for more research and more studies. Uh, these are some of my references that I have used. And as I mentioned earlier that hyperbaric medicine practitioners, we love pressure. And I thank you all for a patient hearing. And in case there are uh, any questions, comments, uh, our group will be more than happy to take that up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for a excellent talk. Uh, that was, again, a very uh, lucid and uh, brief presentation the complex type, uh, topic of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, it has many, many effects other than simply providing oxygen and uh, uh, you know, uh, pressure. There are effects of oxygen on this uh, autonomics and there are effects of oxygen on the inflammatory system, etc. Of course, we did not have the time to discuss all that. Uh, so, so great. Uh, uh, guys, from all of you, this was very nice. So we have some questions from uh, some of the audience. And uh, I think uh, some of the questions have been answered in the chat, but I'd still like to discuss those uh, so that everybody might hear uh, the answers. So uh, uh, Vidya Ma'am is requesting everybody to turn on their uh, cameras, uh, all the speakers. Okay. Uh, Rohit and uh, Gokul, can you please turn on your cameras? Yes, thank you. So fine. So there's, there was one question about uh, uh, how do you differentiate between decompression sickness and cerebral, uh, cerebral arterial gas embolism? I think, Rohit, you'd like to take that question? Yes, sir. So uh, 
the question is difficult because uh, there is it's it's very difficult to differentiate between decompression sickness and cerebral arterial gas embolism prima facie now uh, what we can uh, go by is the history and the presentation so uh, usually a deeper dive a shorter deeper dive with a very rapid ascent usually leads to cerebral arterial gas embolism it presents very severely the presentation itself is very severe it is usually within 10 minutes okay. of uh, arriving on the surface and uh, it usually presents with us uh, with a severe degree of loss of consciousness or uh, unconsciousness or even coma and uh, dcs on the other hand can also present theoretically with this spectrum but it usually is the other end of the spectrum where there is usually musculoskeletal symptom it can present in uh, in a variety of type of uh, dives so not only a deeper shallow a deeper shorter dive but also in other types of dives it so it, it is usually musculoskeletal it usually presents after some time not 10 minutes but maybe an hour or so up to 72 hours and usually it it progresses from a milder it can progress from a milder symptom to a severe symptom rather than presenting with the severe symptom in initially itself so these are some of the broad points in which one can differentiate between uh, cag and dcs uh, uh, yeah, i'd like to add just a small little uh, uh, factor to it all was hunky dory till the year 1989 when there has been a plethora of reports of uh, what is commonly considered as Rohit just described as right-sided bubbles, generally not in the systemic circulation, but either trapped in the musculature or in the soft tissues and joints, presenting as only what is called as typically, which is called as the bends, where the individual had peripheral symptoms. They were very clear and very easy to differentiate as decompression, uh, decompression uh, syndrome as compared to a sudden onset post-pulmonary barotrauma collapse as soon as he surfaces, he falls down, which was clearly a, a cerebral artery gas embolism. What really changed in the year 1989 was the fact that people realized that with uh, more and more emphasis being placed on doing eco, we are picking up more and more of PFOs in divers. And a large number of those so-called bubbles which would have originated in the right and got filtered in the, in the lung bed started bypassing because of the PFO and started going into the cerebral artery uh, as, as embolism. So to, if you are very clear with the etiology, you can very clearly name it as DCS or cage. But for those middle liners who are a little unsure, there is a common terminology brought in called as DCI. Decompression minimus is an all-encompassing terminology which covers any occurrence of a, a bubble. Either it is because of a barotrauma related or an uh, origin because of the pulmonary barotrauma or because of a decompression sickness bubble transiting or bypassing because of a, a patent uh, shunt and going into a cerebral artery. That's a I very that important answer. point. That's a very important point. Of course, the treatment the modality other than the supported care remains the same. That is compression for AGE yes. as well as for DCS. Uh, DCI, DCS producing cerebral artery gas embolism is invariably fatal. Sir. Because what we must understand is from the lung, there is only so much of bubbles that you can cause because of barotrauma. But the DCS barotrauma bubble load is invariably huge. They say that the, the quantum of bubble generation in DCS is very high as compared to the quantum of a minuscule amount of uh, air being tracked into the pulmonary circulation is not so much of a risk. The moment you label a guy as DCS with cerebral artery gas embolism, it is a, a, a poor prognostic indicator. And thankfully, it's rather rare. Thankfully, it's rare. Yeah. It is. It is. Okay. So there was uh, another question regarding any difference between uh, decompression sickness after diving and altitude decompression sickness. I was initially surprised at the term altitude decompression sickness, but then as was brought out, uh, what is being called altitude decompression sickness is decompression sickness due to rapid descent in a balloon or uh, let's say an astro astronaut or a pilot flying high and sudden decompression occurring leading to some decompression sickness. So what do you think, uh, uh, Chaitanya, would there be a difference in presentation between the two forms of decompression sickness? Because uh, ultimately it's bubble formation. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's basically bubble formation because it's to do purely with uh, gas laws and diving physics. 
so it's just bubbles you which are obeying the gas laws so the same thing Although, is happening in astronauts or in pilots so that's why whenever you see these astronauts going they will have a period of uh, long breathing of pure oxygen they all uh, breathe oxygen for a couple of hours before they uh, go for their flights and uh, same is the case for very high altitude uh, fighter planes and reconnaissance planes uh, because otherwise they are liable to suffer from uh, dcs at altitude so the thought occur to me the thought does occur to me that uh, dcs at altitude would of necessity be less in severity because the pressure difference can only be from one atmosphere at sea level to zero whereas a person who's dived under water to let's say four atmosphere and has to surface rapidly for some reason is likely to suffer a far greater bubble load so that might be a one difference it right? also depends uh, on the time might... it also depends yeah, on the time duration because uh, when exactly. dive is uh, for a few minutes or something it may not you know uh, unless right it's you. for a very very long time long the time and then he has to suddenly yeah. shoot up to the surface yeah. the biggest problem with an explosive decompression in high altitude is more of hypoxia than exactly. bubble hypoxia yes. is a far before the dcs before the dcs paralyzes him the hypoxia of explosive decompression will kill him the diver is right. safer because the diver has a jesus backup uh, breathing apparatus all said and done he will continue to breathe oxygen he may keep bubbling nitrogen because he is surfacing faster but he will not have that rapid degree of hypoxia setting in as it is seen in an explosive decompression situation in an aircraft they are very rare explosive decompression does not happen other than non military aircrafts you say sir, that a i would like to speed. add one thing yes sir yes, right. yeah i would like to add one thing uh, which is a bit of a confounding thing i mean i'm crossing the two now uh, firstly the altitude dcs per se what we are talking about in astronauts and, and in uh, select group of fighter pilots and all it is a very very rare thing which i i think very few people would get opportunity to witness that is number one number two i think there can uh, i think the uh, person who asked this question is perhaps hinting at something else it is perhaps flying after diving so uh, the person asking the question is uh, professor rsp singh No, no, I'm not asking. No, no, no. There's another. There's some doctor uh, Vijay, I think. So, so, Ajay. so I don't know. I he might be asking this only, but uh, just just touching on this that flying after diving uh, can precipitate decompression sickness. Decompression. So within so after any diving activity, broadly as a general rule, we can say no di no flying for 48 hours. So that you is, know, I mean, there are nuances, but as a very very general thumb rule, one can stick to that. Something anecdotal. the united states uh, naval diving research team in the 60s reported this case of one uh, gentleman who was a diver part of the team who would get dcs every time he would take a commercial flight every time one rather predisposed gentleman uh, but of course that's absolutely rare uh, another very rare situation where you would get an altitude decompression sickness is if you use the uh the sea level tables without the altitude conversion factor for a dive which you are doing in a higher altitude location that is that is rarest of the rare i mean it is only in the military paradigm and that too in exactly uh, because uh, because uh, india has got himalayas and you have lakes and then we as military people go and dive there so we But have the, the navy the divers doing dives for the uh, benefit of all those who are uh, here for non military Uh, the navy divers often go and dive at 14 15000 feet not often but once in a while they do dive at 14 15000 feet and uh, in deep lakes uh, and of course uh, the lake paikara is that uh, which is the lake which is close to wellington uh, yeah, where they do commonly dive paikara, paikara. that's yeah. probably but that's not so high Yeah. Fine. Now moving on. Uh, there was another question. Uh, 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 sorry to interrupt. Uh, Doctor okay. Ajay Kumar has his hand up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, I would just like to add on this. Uh, uh, in altitude DCS uh, in aerospace medicine, we keep giving training to all these pilots for hypoxia, where they are taken up to twenty-five thousand feet routinely, military as well as in civil. In India, we don't have that concept for civil pilots, but definitely for uh, military pilots. Abroad, even civil civil pilots undergo this training. So, uh, altitude decompression sickness is a major concern in this cohort of uh, under trainees pilots. Or pilot who get exposure uh, to hypoxia during training. 
unfortunately or fortunately in our experience this has not been a major concern in uh, southeast asian counterpart that's why my another question was is there any racial differences into that uh, you see like western literature again. they have lots of incidences may i interrupt you dr ajay to ask you sure. again uh, so since you appear to be an aviation or aerospace medicine uh, uh, specialist Uh, so when we talk of altitude decompression sickness, you again brought in hypoxia. So are you talking of the composite phenomena of decompression at altitude leading predominantly to hypoxia and secondarily to bubble formation? Or when you talk of high altitude, uh, hear me out. When you talk of altitude DCS, are you talking of primarily the bubble load and hypoxia as a coincident uh, feature? What is it? Is uh, when you call, talk of so in aerospace medicine, when you talk of DCS, is hypoxia your primary concern? No, sir. Uh, because hypoxia is taken care uh, with the supplemental oxygen. All these pilots are uh, throughout on supplemental oxygen. Only when they reach twenty-five thousand feet or designated altitude, they will remove the oxygen mask and experience hypoxia. Again, uh, put on the mask and they are brought down. so the duration the altitude and duration for which they maintain themselves at the altitude results into the dcs just like in diving so this is a uh, major concern they get, in so the cabin is not pressurized the cabin is not pressurized so that, that uh, altitude chamber works in a system it, it's opposite to your hyperbaric chamber yeah, in hyperbaric. altitude chamber we okay. reduce the atmospheric pressure but what pressure so, are they kept at so what pressure are they kept at are they taken so at 25000 feet pressure Yes, uh, routinely uh, we uh, in uh, I am we practice twenty two thousand feet to twenty five thousand feet. So theoretically, feet, Dr. Ajay, uh, risk of twenty five thousand feet, the pressure would be about uh, if I'm not wrong about three hundred millimeters of mercury atmospheric pressure. So is that the pressure that uh, they are uh, exposed sir, to? Yes, sir. Uh, what what is being discussed is a theory. No, because I wish to understand the question well. so uh, i i i i i get a gist of what the question is about sir uh, the the there are two factors which produce decompression sickness one is the pressure gradient second is the duration of exposure if you going to have a transient exposure of a pilot at a at a certain low pressure situation it is unlikely to produce sir i mean i'm i'm saying unlikely not because i want to discount your question but uh, i do not see any reference to any literature where a large series of training related decompression sickness has been reported even from iim or from any other non non southeast asian country because decompression sickness is also a topic of my interest it is a theoretical possibility but your what precludes it from happening is the very very short duration of exposure this is 300 mm of mercury for a few minutes it is it is impossible to produce any clinically relevant symptomatology in such people unless you are interested in doing a, a, a doppler to prove that bubbles are formed whereas he is asymptomatic we should not talk about it as a patient at all because they will never report you sick because they will not have any symptoms okay it's so i think we we'll take it actually we we'll leave it here we we'll leave it here because there are some other questions too uh interesting uh, discussion dr vijay but uh, for constraints of time we shall leave it here uh, so there was a, an, a question on any differences in pediatric population uh, as far as uh, decompression sickness was it about decompression sickness it was uh, it about talked about diving diving illness uh, I, I think, I I think i'll diving. take this now uh, uh, i think uh, now uh, pediatric diving is uh, something which is a very very uh, niche thing not there are not in our country but internationally there are regulations there are restrictions on the minimum age at which a child can dive and uh, long and short of it a child lesser than 14 years should not be diving per se snorkeling yes uh, less than 7 meters assisted diving maybe in diving what we have discussed now less than 14 years uh, majority of the countries do not allow it uh, explicitly don't allow it although in india we don't have any such regulation basically because of the detrimental effect of the bubbling on the on the cartilage on the joints 
on the as yet unossified jo joints so uh, pediatric diving i think is uh, very very it's it's very unlikely very very i think there will be hardly a dozen people around the world less than 14 years who will be diving this kind of thing yeah recreational diving snorkeling 2 to 3 meters on uh, assisted diving in a hat or something yes but those those are not likely to lead to a diving illness per se what we have gone through in this particular exposition so i think that is what i can offer in regarding pediatric uh, exposure okay thank you rohit that was uh, i think uh, that rounds off the discussion one last question about is osteoporosis an issue in long term diving maybe what they mean is due to uh, microgravity is osteoporosis an issue i have never heard of it osteonecrosis of the head of femur yes but osteoporosis Never heard of because so after all this, divers do get uh, back on land and are exposed to gravity. So normally, osteoporosis is not a long-term uh, effect seen in uh, okay. most of the divers, including the commercial divers. But dysbaric osteonecrosis uh, is a concern in commercial divers, but not osteoporosis as such because uh, the time that they are uh, actually diving, where they experience this weightlessness and all, like the say the astronauts. Uh, is limited because most of the diving works will be for a couple of hours and then they come back even in saturation dives they will be in the chamber where they can move around and they don't experience weightlessness there so the weightlessness kind of thing is only in the water and that's not for a very very long time so uh, osteoporosis as such is not a major issue in long term diving and then uh, dr manu has also asked that uh, recreational diving is catching on any take uh, on take home messages for doctors scuba diving on a holiday uh, the only thing is that they should enjoy the scuba diving they should be medically fit and uh, adhere to all the safety protocols and most importantly like uh, rohit mentioned that give a break before they take the flight out so after uh, doing the last dive they should at least wait for 24 to 48 hours before they take the flight unfortunately a lot of people are in a rush and 6 hours after the dive if they take then there is an increased chance for developing dcs in the aircraft right okay thank you and uh, dr hitesh agarwal wants to know what is the rate of compression to avoid ear barotrauma i think he means rate of decompression right to so avoid normally uh, in the chamber the dictum is that especially if it's a therapeutic thing planned therapeutic uh, thing for the patients uh, generally the recommended rate as per the us navy treatment table is 20 feet per minute but in case it's a emergency like uh, patients with the uh, uh, barotraumas or uh, dcs or something and they are already trained divers so as fast as the diver can tolerate, we can uh, compress them to depth. But normally for patients uh, who are seeking SBOT therapy, its uh, rate is supposed to be 20 feet per minute. Okay, thank you. So I think uh, that has been a good, excellent presentation, a good introduction to diving and hyperbaric medicine. Hyperbaric medicine today is catching on in India. I find increasingly more and more centers have hyperbaric chambers. So I think it's been nice this entire talk uh, with them. And I hope you agree. And all the other doctors who uh, I see there's still 32 participants around. I hope uh, everybody enjoyed it and liked it. And thank you for this opportunity to us to uh, make this presentation. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for putting all this together, Dr. Singh. And uh, personal thanks to uh, Rohit uh, Chaitanya and uh, um, uh, <clears throat> vocal for uh, you know sparing your time twice because we couldn't do it when the first time we planned. So thank you so much for making yourself available again. Uh, Radha Krishna, any comments? Vidya, I think much water has flown under the bridge tonight. And uh, uh, I should say yet another great evening, just like the one we had last time with aviation medicine. A lot of information, a lot of new information. And uh, 
wonderful speakers, very accomplished speakers and the moderator. Actually, the discussion was uh, extremely good. The few times I got scared was when there are so many boils, love, this love, that love, that reminded me of my college days and, you know, the P1, P2, that's scary. I mean, <laughs> if one thing that will scare me away from a, the underwater medicine, these uh, laws which are very difficult to memorize. But then I think the cherry on the cake is uh, an eminent psychiatrist talking about wound management. I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I'm a surgeon. And then, you know, <laughs> surgery is a different ball game altogether. But then, as they say, you know, the military men are a different creed. They, they take up anything, they do it so very well. And I think, uh, uh, and I should also mention that the, the grace and the uh, you know, the generosity with which all the speakers responded when the last time when we have to postpone and it's, it's a real, uh, a real, uh, my salute to all of them. It's a wonderful session, sir, and it's always nice listening to uh, men in uniform. Thank you okay. very much for your kind words, sir. Thank you. And so, Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. So when we started off, uh, actually both Radha Krishna and I are alumni of Jikma Pondicherry. And so one of the things uh, Marvelous uh, Medicine was supposed to do is bring Learning General Surgery, which is the parent organization, the closed Facebook group, uh, to uh, Jikma alumni. But uh, so uh, to, the, to the extent that sometimes people think that Marvelous Medicine is a Jikma uh, alumni get together. So I'm, I'm so glad that, uh, I mean, we have spread so much. And now in the past few weeks, we have actually uh, managed to bring the armed forces uh, doctors uh, uh, to meet, I mean, uh, the general uh, doctors to meet the accomplished uh, armed forces doctors. Thank you so much, all of you, once again. And uh, we will be reaching out to you in future for some more niche topics uh, because these things need to be talked about. And uh, most of us were even unaware that such courses exist. So now that we are at the age where our children are, you know, doing their uh, post-graduation and stuff. So I am trying to get all my friends to get their children to listen to all these things. There is so much more to medicine than what we all uh, learned uh, many years ago. Thank you so much for joining and we'll look forward to another session in the future with you. Uh, next week, after these two esoteric uh, topics, the next week we'll be by, very down to earth. We are going to be <clears throat> talking about uh, professional indemnity insurance and uh, how to tackle <clears throat> medical legal cases when you're faced with them. So we'll meet you again next Thursday with another episode of Marvelous Medicine. Till then, take care and stay safe. Good night.